Dear intercessors, the title of my message this week, uh, which is also a theme for the coming year, is called to battle. We are involved in a tremendous spiritual warfare at this time that can only be won as to the same extent that we are willing to give ourselves to prayer. That's my ma main message uh, for this week, and it's actually the main message that I feel for the coming year. The theme for our school of prayer, my school of prayer that you can uh, order uh, online if you have uh, read the text below this YouTube. The theme for that uh, school of prayer is from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, where it says, The end of all things is at hand. And if it was when Peter wrote this epistle 2,000 years ago, it certainly is right now. I believe we're living right on the very edge to the coming of the Son of Man from heaven. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, what is the very first thing that Peter mentions in connection with the end times? Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. We are to live a disciplined life uh, that is characterized by prayer. That's how it can be translated also uh, in uh, this verse. In view of the end times, the number one priority in our lives must be that we have a powerful personal prayer life, a powerful personal relationship with the Lord on a daily basis on our knees in prayer. And that's what our school of prayer the, uh, that I have, uh, the purpose is to help you to develop such a daily powerful prayer life. And that is going to be a priority uh, for the coming year, to mobilize as many prayer warriors as, as we possibly can for uh, a breakthrough uh, against the forces of darkness uh, in order for God to send revival. When uh, I first started to walk with the Lord many years ago uh, in the early 70s, uh, one of my mentors was uh, the uh, late uh, Shell Sjöberg in Sweden, a general of prayer who founded Intercessors for Sweden. In the brochure that he uh, wrote for to launch this prayer movement, he quoted from uh, James uh, chapter 5, and uh, where it says about uh, um, prayer. Let's read from verse 16 and to verse 18. James chapter 5. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it says the prayer of a righteous person. Just one person. The prayer of just one righteous person has great power uh, as it is working. Let me read that sentence again. The prayer of a righteous person just one individual, just one pe person who gives himself to prayer. It has great power as it is working. And then it says in, in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like uh, ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Through Elijah's prayer life, he was able to turn an entire nation back to God. So Shel Sherber wrote in that brochure where he, that launched the prayer movement, Intercessors for Sweden, uh, 50 years ago. Elijah is the prototype for the end time intercessor. I have never forgotten that. Because God has promised that in the end times, he's going to uh, send the Elijah, just like he did when before Yeshua Jesus came the first time, he uh, anointed John the Baptist 
in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for uh, Yeshua, Jesus, when he came the first time. And the same anointing, that uh, spirit and power of Elijah is going to be manifest again in the end times uh, in order to prepare the way for the return of Messiah from heaven. And it's primarily for that purpose that we have that promise in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And that means that the same prayer life that Elijah had is going to be available for those who are eager and willing to uh, give themselves to that uh, task, that calling of prayer in the end times. And remember, Peter says that is the number one priority in view of the end times. It is to make sure that we are uh, disciplined, self-controlled for the purpose of of prayer. So um, we are going to uh, mobilize and educate in this prayer movement during the coming year as many intercessors and prayer warriors as we possibly can. Because now the hour is late and God is looking for those who are willing to give themselves to prayer in the end times. Hallelujah. To uh, Use them in such a way that we can see spiritual breakthrough and revival take place. There is going to be a harvest reaped for the Lord in the end times uh, uh, so that he will have a people made ready for him when he comes. And it is in that anointing that we want to operate in uh, these uh, final days before this end time, before the coming and the return of the Son of Man. Elijah is that uh, pattern for us. Uh, And there are three phases to the ministry of Elijah to turn the nation of Israel back to God. A nation that had fallen away, that had started to give themselves to idolatry, to sexual immorality, uh, and to lewdness of every kind, uh, a lukewarm, half-hearted, compromised uh, people that was haltering between two opinions. In that situation, in that dark spiritual situation, God raised up Elijah to call the people back to him, uh, to God. And the, the three phases that we can see in Elijah's ministry was, number one, that he began to pray. He appeared before uh, King Ahab, and he said, From now on, there's not going to be neither dew nor rain on the earth unless I say so. And then he left the king's palace, and he went out into the wilderness. And here in the book of James, it says that he prayed for three and a half years so that the uh, heavens did not give any rain, so that he could get the attention of the entire nation. After three and a half years of intercession, of powerful prayer uh, in solitude, uh, giving himself uh, to that faithful, enduring prayer, came after those three and a half years, the second phase, which was the confrontation with the powers of darkness. He came back to the the king and said, go and gather all of Israel to me uh, on uh, Mount Carmel and uh, because God wants to send rain. And when he had confronted and destroyed those uh, prophets, false prophets uh, who were um, leading the, the, the people into idolatry and apostasy, when he had defeated them, he had first confronted them head on, alone against everybody else. In that confrontation, he defeated them. And then came the third stage, which was he prayed for rain. And that rain, of course, is a symbol of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, revival that came as a result of, number one, his prayer, his enduring faithful prayer, number two, his confrontation with the powers of darkness, and then his prayer for the rain 
to to uh, fall again. So that is what we can see as a pattern also that is going to take place in the end times. We first must see a people willing to give themselves to prayer just in the same way that we read about Elijah. He is like a pattern for the end time intercessor. Oh, hallelujah. I proclaim this coming year to be a year of intensified prayer. If you have forsaken the prayer altar in your home, uh, go back and raise it up again. Dedicate yourselves afresh and anew to a ministry of prayer. And then go through my school of prayer. Uh, It is uh, able to inspire you and to educate you you to get this uh, personal, powerful prayer life. And that's what we are going to um, uh, witness in more and more people's lives in this coming year. I'm so excited about this. God has allowed us to be alive for such a time as this. And we have been um, called by God to raise up at least 10,000 prayer warriors, just like the people that uh, defeated uh, the uh, forces of darkness during uh, Deborah uh, and Barak. We read about in the the book of Judges, chapter 4 and 5. And in... uh, the, of course, the calling that Barak had was to summon uh, and call together at least 10,000 from the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali to join him in battle against Sisera and uh, with the 900 chariots of <clears throat> iron. And it says then in chapter 5 uh, in and verse 18, uh, Sebelon is a people who risk their lives to the death. Naphtali too on the heights of the field or the battlefield. They were willing to risk their lives. And friends, we have come t- now to a point where the situation is so desperate that the only way we are going to be able to win the victory is if we are willing to lose our lives, to risk our lives on the battlefield, that we do not shrink back from death. It says about the overcomers in the book of Revelation, they overcame him, that is the enemy, the devil, uh, through the power of the blood of the Lamb and through the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. They were willing to risk their lives. And I'm, I am... Uh, so looking forward to see this army being raised up to give themselves to fervent prayer just like Elijah did so that we can also confront the forces of darkness and God can send rain on the earth. There will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will uh, usher in the greatest revival of all times. God has, as I said, uh, allowed us to be alive at this time. And it says in uh, Psalm 110, willing, your people shall be willing in the day of battle. Friends, this is the day of battle. Uh, Let me read it to you from Psalm 110. It says in verse 3, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. That is the dew and freshness of resurrection power, resurrection life. That's what dew is a symbol for in the scriptures. And it says here prophetically, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. That is what we are going to see in this coming year. We are being called to battle, and many are going to listen to this voice calling us to battle and offer themselves willing, willingly. Will you be one of them? Make up your mind that God is going to um, use you in a mighty way in prayer in this coming year. Of course, uh, 
there is such power when we also come together in the unity of the Spirit to pray corporately together. But the effectiveness of that corporate prayer is dependent on the individual's own personal prayer life. Because the basic prayer, the basic form of prayer, I should say, is what Yeshua Jesus is describing in Matthew chapter 6, where it says, uh, and when, <clears throat> uh, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That is what we are going to see happen in this coming year. Thousands of people who are willing to risk their lives uh, shutting themselves in into their prayer closet and begin to fight on their knees to see this mighty breakthrough that God has promised. I also want to read the famous passage from the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, it's so powerful and I um, want to encourage you to take these words to your heart for the coming year. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Let me read those words again. Finally, be strong in the Lord, not in yourself, but in depending on him, trusting in him, clinging to him, giving yourselves completely on the altar to him, sacrificing your own life, uh, lay it on the altar, commit your whole life to him, and he will become your strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's the word of God for you for this coming year. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength or power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And friends, like it says in the book of Revelation, the devil has come down on earth uh, in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. There is going to be such an intense spiritual battle in the end times just before the Lord returns. And that's why we need to be so strong uh, in the Lord and to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against all the wicked schemes of the devil the clever schemings of the enemy. He, he is uh, the serpent from the beginning who is uh, uh, more cunning than anybody else. He knows how to ensnare people, but only when we live in a close relationship to God can we escape all those snares. And then it says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That's the time we're living in, in the end times, and having done all to stand firm. And then it lists the... The armor of God here. But uh, we are, whether we like it or not, involved in this uh, struggle, this warfare with the cosmic powers ruling in this dark world. Uh, we cannot escape it. We cannot uh, uh, hide from it. We have to face it head on. And thank God we have the ability to face these powers in victory because we have been given the tools, we've been given the weapons by which we can overcome. Glory to God. Uh, it says in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, in uh, I'm going to read from verse 1 here. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Listen to this. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. 
That is the power that is ruling over those who are not living in obedience to God's will, who are, who are not born again by the Spirit of God and have begun to walk with God in obedience. Uh, all uh, who are not in that um, category, they are being controlled by the prince of the power of the air. And that's the battle we are involved with, with that spiritual force of wickedness that is operating in the world today. And we must uh, make sure that we have a powerful prayer life so that we can overcome in this very dark uh, time. Um, I want to recommend to you a book that has been an eye-opener for me. And uh, I have, in fact, never read a book that has been so uh, able to uh, pull back the curtain, uh, so to speak, to reveal this spiritual battle that we are involved in right now, in uh, especially the Western Hemisphere. And that is uh, Jonathan Kahn's latest book, The Return of the Gods. I want to recommend you to read this book. Uh, it is uh, very seldom that I recommend a book this strongly, but I really want you to to get a hold of this book. Uh, you can order it, of course, uh, on the Internet and, and uh, get it to you in different ways. But this book... It, uh, it shows us the spiritual battle so clearly that we are involved with now. And just like Elijah was able to confront those exact same powers that we are now dealing with in the end times, we are called to, conf- to battle those forces as well and to confront them in uh, victorious prayer. Let me just briefly say that... Uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn is basing much of his teaching in the book from the passage in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. And I'm going to read that passage. It says, When, an un- and when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. The key here is empty, okay? Then, verse 45, then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. But listen now to the conclusion of this entire teaching by Yeshua Jesus. It says at the end here of verse 45, so also will it be with this evil generation. In other words, this parable that uh, Yeshua is giving here about an evil spirit leaving a person and then returning again and when he finds that it, the house where he used to live in that person, so to speak, if it is empty, then he says uh, he will go and find seven even more evil spirits than himself and come back and take up possession of that house. And that's what Jonathan Kahn says has happened with Western civilization. The gospel came 2,000 years ago and dispelled the uh, uh, spiritual forces, the demonic powers that ruled the civilization in both Rome and, and, uh, and Greece, filled with idolatry, filled with sexual immorality and debauchery and wickedness of every kind. Uh, eventually, the Word of God was able to uh, dispel those forces of darkness. And they have been living outside of society for almost 2,000 years, or at least 1,700 years or so. But what has happened now in the last um, 
century, two centuries, is that Western civilization has begun to reject God, turn its back on God, which means that the house has become empty, and a house will never stay empty. When an evil spirit that used to be there uh, comes and finds the house empty, he will then return together with seven more wicked spirits than himself. And that's what is the reason for the rapid, complete moral deterioration and decay that is taking place in Western civilization today, right before our very eyes. We are living now in the days of apostasy. Uh, And not just a apostasy, but the apostasy. Let me just take you... (laughs) Uh, and show you one example of that. There has never in 2,000 years of church history ever been even uh, considered that it should be okay to be uh, a living a homosexual lifestyle. But that is now being accepted in the church for the first time ever in history. This is one of the primary examples of what Paul calls not just a apostasy, but the apostasy. And that is the apostasy that will precede the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, that will come and take his rule for three and a half years, just preceding the coming of the Lord. And this is what Jonathan Kahn is exposing uh, so clearly in this book, The Return of of the gods. It is stunning. It is just amazing how uh, in such detail the uh, return of these demonic powers according to the the patterns that we can find in ancient mythology and also of course based on the word of God how they are able have been able so quickly to take possession of our culture, and our civilization in just the last 30, 40 years. Um, It is an uh, eye-opener to read this book. And I uh, I say this is a a handbook uh, that you need to, to become aware of the spiritual battle that we are involved in right now. But as I said, there is... Um, victory over these uh, demonic forces. And uh, the promise that we can uh, uh, take heart in is the last three verses in the prophetic scriptures or the Old Testament, as it is called uh, in our translations, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. And I'm going to read them. Uh, It says in verse 4, Remember the law of my servant Moses. Let me point out, this is the third last verse in the Old Testament. We're just turning the page here into the New Testament, the New Covenant. And you would think that the Bible should say, please try to forget the law of Moses because that is now going to pass away very soon. Uh, It's over and done with in the new covenant. No, 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 no. This is a passage about the end times where it says instead, remember the law of my servant Moses because the apostasy is also described as the mystery of lawlessness. It is the forsaking of God's laws and commandments, the Ten Commandments that are being abandoned today, preparing the way for the Antichrist. That's why we are commanded here to remember the law of um, Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him on Horeb for all Israel. And then it says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That great and awesome day or dreadful day, as it says in other, many other translations, is a reference to the second coming of the Lord, not his first coming. That was the year of his uh, uh, proclaiming the acceptable and favorable year of the Lord, not uh, the day of God's wrath and judgment. That's what we are 
uh, heading towards right now in the end times, the day of judgment in connection with the coming uh, and the return of the Lord. And in view of that, God is going to, before uh, that day comes, send the prophet Elijah. Now, this was partially fulfilled through the ministry of John the Baptist, where it says that um, the spirit and power of Elijah would be resting on him to prepare the way for the Lord. But the same spiritual um, equipment, the spirit and power of Elijah is going to be poured out also in the end times preceding the second coming. And that is what we can expect. The, and part of that, I said, is we are also going to see people uh, giving themselves to prayer just like Elijah did. Uh, he was uh, a man of prayer, and he is the pattern for the end time intercessor. So that same uh, anointing to pray that we saw in Elijah's life is also going to be available to those who are willing to take hold of it. Who cr- will cry out like uh, Elisha did, give me a double portion of your spirit that he cried out to Elijah. Now, Elijah and Moses go together. They were together with Yeshua Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And um, so Elijah is the one that will restore um, and uh, cause people, should I say, uh, to repent from lawlessness and turn back to God's ways that God Uh, has so clearly laid out through Moses. And then it says in verse 6 here, uh, the final verse, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So here we see that the battle is going to be focused on the family. And that is so clearly how this is laid out in Jonathan Kahn's book, The Return of the Gods, that the focus of these destructive powers, these demonic powers, is to destroy the family. Now, this verse also is talking about not just the physical family, but also God's family, the spiritual family of fathers and sons. And I see this as a picture between Israel as our fathers and the children being Uh, those who have been uh, born again into the kingdom, which uh, you can call the church. There is going to be a unity that will come between Israel and uh, the church in the end times. But here I want to emphasize now that it is talking about also the restoration of the family. That is the battleground that we are going to face head on in uh, this prayer movement uh, in coming days. And that's why we have are calling now for a day of fasting and prayer the first Friday of every month uh, during the coming year. So join us in that uh, battle. Uh, not everyone can uh, do a complete fast, but everyone can fast in some way to forsake something for the purpose of prayer, extra uh, prayer the first Friday of each month uh, to pray for the restoration of family, for the fathers to be turned to the children and children turned to their fathers, that there will be this healing uh, between uh, parents and their children, that the family will come together and be restored in the end times, because that's going to be the bulwark against the evil, destructive forces forces in the end times, that there are restored families. Restored families will become also an instrument to, to, uh, that God will use for the final harvest. I believe that it's going to be more restored families that will uh, take care of those who are going to be brought into the kingdom, the harvest that is coming. It's not going to be enough with churches to deal with those people. There must be homes that are healed, that are whole, that are restored, that begin can begin to uh, take in wounded people, pray for them, uh, host them sometimes day and night to, to see them being restored back uh, to God in, in, in a more complete way. 
it's going to require restored families for the great and final revival that is going to sweep the earth. So we will enter into this battle now in the coming year in an increased way. Like I said, the first Friday of uh, every month, we are calling for fasting and prayer for the restoration of family. And uh, I want to end by saying, if you haven't gone through my school of prayer, that uh, will help you and equip you to uh, uh, get a powerful personal prayer life on a daily basis, I strongly recommend you to uh, uh, go through that school of prayer. you find uh, the de- in the description below this YouTube uh, the information how you can uh, acquire that school of prayer. So let's stand together. Let's join hand in hand. Let's pray in unison for this mighty move of God to come in these end times. Uh, and beginning with people giving themselves to fervent prayer. We are going to need those powerful personal prayer lives in the end time in order to make it. That's number one. But it also, it is through those uh, powerful intercessors that God wants to raise up that we're also going to see the spiritual breakthrough that will lead to the final great harvest. So we have a great job to do. And uh, thank you for standing with us financially. Uh, We are uh, building up a base for this ministry now here uh, in um, this land, the land of Israel, uh, to reach the nations. And we need your support. And we are so grateful for those of you who can um, hear the voice of God and and, uh, be led by him in these matters. So thank you and may God bless you richly. We look forward to great and uh, glorious days ahead in answer to prayer. Shalom and God bless you.